Good morning. Thank you very much. Um, I'm told the acoustics in here are not too great, so, um, and I know I tend to mumble, I tend to drift off into the fine webs of my thoughts, so can I just check, am I clear as a bell um, to everyone at the moment? Clear as a bell. Thank you. Okay, and uh, let me know if um, I, it gets overpoweringly loud or if I drift off. I always think of a Scots accent as a particularly pure form of French. <laughs> so, um, my general question today is, what does visual experience have to do with vision science? I mean, it seems in a way that that's what vision science should all be about. And on the other hand, it's usually treated as a great mystery not addressable by vision science itself, what visual experience is. I think that this is, I, I do take this seriously, it's a very difficult problem, and I think that the roots go back to where um, contemporary science was founded back in the 17th century. 17th century science had two great programs. One was um, the ambition of explaining all of physical reality in terms of mathematical laws governing the behavior of fundamental particles and forces. That was an extremely ambitious program. They couldn't at the time have had any reason to expect that it was going to be as successful as it was, and it succeeded out of all reasonableness. The other great program was as well as the quantitative world of the basic physical magnitudes, there's the qualitative world of everyday experiences, the color and smells and so on. And the second great program was to analyze the qualitative world in terms of its relation to consciousness. And these two programs are deep in the way that every educated person thinks about the world today. But while the first program has been a great success, the second program has simply been a disaster. It really hasn't worked at all. And in a way, the text of this conference is a tribute to that, the idea that there is some important but unfathomable mystery about consciousness. Now, I think it's taken me a very long time to see it, but this whole program of explaining the qualitative world in terms of its relations to consciousness is simply hopeless, and we really should abandon that. In the, as it were, the poster child for the program is color. And most people would regard it as some kind of insight that color is to be explained in terms of its relationship to consciousness. But when you ask exactly how that explanation is going to go, everything suddenly becomes obscure. One natural idea is that there is a kind of mental paint in the mind. As people sometimes say, there is the red out there and there is the red in here. And then they point at their head. Um, but what is that mental paint? supposed to be? What is the red in here? Um, on the one hand, it's, it's not obviously, it's obviously not something that we encounter in everyday experience, because in everyday vision, all we encounter are the properties of the concrete objects around us. We encounter the external characteristic of observed things. So what goes on is, people say, well, Nonetheless, even although in everyday experience what you think you're encountering is a characteristic of the external object, there is no such characteristic of the external object. Out there are only the basic physical forces. Um, so we have to hypothesize that in the head there is some mental paint that you didn't know about before that is, as it were, gilding and staining the objects out there. 
So in this way of reading it, the mental paint is a property hypothesized to explain what's oh, the nature of your ordinary experience. And this gives the talk about mental paint a kind of reassuringly technical feel, as if you're discovering some arcane fact about the world when you talk about it. But on the other hand, the mental paint is supposed to be the most familiar and commonplace feature of experience. It's supposed to be the characterization of what it's like to see something red. There isn't supposed to be anything postulated or hidden about it at all. And this produces a great deal of complexity and uncertainty in the literature and in its readers as to what we're actually talking about when we talk about the red in here. But the fact is that it's simply a contradiction. There isn't a coherent notion here at all. On the one hand, it's supposed to be a hypothesized, postulated property that explains our experience being the way it is. On the other hand, it's supposed to be the most direct characterization possible of our experience itself. Nothing could be both. Partly in a reaction to the obscurity of this kind of talk of qualia, many philosophers, probably most now, would say, all right, let's drop the talk about qualia. Color, we should still think of uh, as defined in relation to our mind, but don't think in terms of the color in here or the color out there. What happens is that we represent the world as colored. Color is really something generated by our capacity for mental representation of this qualitative characteristic of the external reality. But again, there's a really simple basic problem here, which is the only theory of representation that anyone has ever been able to think of is a causal theory of representation. Ultimately, um, our minds represent the worlds the way they do because they're causal responses to the presence of the qualities or characteristics of the world that um, they're responding to. But on this purely representationalist view, there isn't any qualitative color out there. There isn't any qualitative color out in here. There is only the representation of the qualitative characteristic. But how could that have happened? How could there be such a thing figuring in a causal void and staining the rest of the universe with it? So again, um, an appeal to representation here just doesn't help at all. We have no understanding of what notion of representation we'd be appealing to. I think the right conclusion is to abandon that 17th century program. We need a kind of Copernican revolution about the qualitative world. We need to stop thinking of consciousness as being what the rest of the qualitative world is defined in terms of. There is indeed a real problem, a highly non-trivial problem, of explaining how the common sense world the world we encounter every day, the tables, the chairs, the other people, social life, there is a problem of explaining how that relates to the world as explained by basic physics. That's a hard problem and it has to be addressed. I don't at all think it's an intractable problem or an unfathomable mystery. But, uh -huh. but the point is that in, carry, in addressing that problem, of how the common sense world relates to the world as described by physics, um, consciousness has no special place. It just doesn't help. That's the point about the, uh, the uselessness of appealing to mental uh, uh, qualia or um, an unexplained notion of mental representation. We should take the common sense world as something in terms of which we can explain consciousness. I mean, this kind of position was prefigured by G.E. Moore back in 1903. Moore said, and if you apply this to visual experience, um, uh, consciousness is something in respect of which all sensations are alike, and then there's something else in respect of which 
one sensation differs from another, that second term is the object of the sensation. So the picture is, there is a sui generis relation of consciousness, or let's say visual experience in particular, that you can stand into something brown. There's, you can stand in that very same relation of consciousness to something blue. Um, what differentiates the two experiences is not anything particularly experiential, is what's on the other end of the relation of experience. And Moore said, am I, I am as directly aware of the existence of material things in space as of my own sensations. So we can take the color as simply a characteristic of the world to which you are related by this generic relation of experience. You, when I say experience is generic, what I mean is if you take a relation like being one yard away from you can be one yard away from practically anything. It's the same relation, no matter what it is, that you're one yard away from. Similarly, you can be in the relation visually, experience, ex visually experiencing first to one color, then to another. The relation is the same. It's what's at the other end of the relation that is varying. So let's go back to the original question. What does visual experience, if you think of it like this, have to do with vision science? Um, I mean, the way I've set it up is pretty much in tune with the way we ordinarily talk about visual experience. We talk about ordinary seeing as factive. If I say, I see that the microphone is on the table, that the man is on the chair, then that can't happen. You can't see that things are so unless they really are so. Seeing, as we ordinarily talk about it, is a relation whether to facts in the world or to particular people. So I can say I see that Sally is here or I see Sally. And I can't do either of those unless Sally's here, unless that is Sally. So it's factive. It's a relation to what's going on out there. Now, um, our ordinary talk about seeing, our ordinary common sense talk about seeing, doesn't have any interest in mapping the brain. We do in general talk about mental states as causing one another, and arguably that is shot through with the idea that there is some physical implementation or other. But vision science has a constitutive interest in mapping the brain. Vision science is, in the end, interested in explaining what all these cells are doing in a way that ordinary common sense psychology isn't. So, and it's certainly not relational in a way that our ordinary talk about seeing is. So how can we find a point of contact between these two? Well, one um, natural idea is when you're seeing something out there, when I'm seeing Sally, when I'm seeing the five in a display, that's a relation between me and the thing. And of course, there is some mechanism in the brain subserving this. There is some mechanism describable by vision science as subserving that conscious relation. But where exactly are the is the point of contact? Well, it's a commonplace idea that attention is a notion that's very important in folk psychology and it seems to be a key notion in vision science and that maybe there is some relation between them. Um, I mean, people sometimes, uh, Jesse Prinz, for example, says con visual consciousness is necessary and sufficient for visual attention. Now, I think that's right that there's a connect between attention, uh, visual experience, and vision science, but I want to suggest that the point of contact is different to what is usually put. Attending to something has as an outcome that you can determine what the various characteristics of the object are, and is usually taken that consciousness is, as it were, the outcome of the act of attention, is what properties of the object you've accessed in attending to it. That's what constitutes the content of your conscious experience. I think that's not, I, I want to try to show you that that's not quite the right way to think of it. 
Um, there are two different roles that experienced properties can play in visual attention, in attending to objects. And I take this contrast from Huang and Paschler's uh, two th uh, Psych Review 2007 article. Um, suppose um, you're looking at a figure five written in gold on a dappled or brindled field so that there is no systemic difference between the five and its background um, in terms of luminance or anything other than color. So if you can, actually I guess statistically there are going to be quite a number of people here who don't see anything except a bunch of dots on the screen. <laughs> so let, um, let me tell you that what I think I see is a five picked out there in something that's a kind of greeny gold. That all right? Okay. Um, now, if you can see that five, then you must be having color experience. That's the whole point of a color vision test. Um, but what you're doing when you see that five is you are using the color to lift out a region or object here. You are using the five to put the color to pull out this object. And you can then go on to ask further questions about it. Is it a number? What number is it? What kind of font is it? Um, so you've used color as the basis for selection here. But in principle, you could have that. You could see the five without being able to access the colors of things at all. Um, young children have color vision in place, have categorical color vision in place as early as three or four months. Learning a color vocabulary is notoriously very difficult for children, surprisingly difficult. The age at which color, young children learn color words has gone way up this century, I mean has sped up this century, partly because uh, children tend to live in highly color-coded environments these days. But around 1900, it was typical for children not to have got their basic uh, four or six color words until they were six years old. Darwin thought his own children were colorblind because they just couldn't get it into their heads what the colors of things were. Um, you can take a child of two who already has hundreds of words in their vocabulary and show them this is a red one, this is a green one, this is a red one, this is a green one, um, uh, seven or eight hundred times and they still won't get it. There is even a word in German for it, Farbendumheit. That <laughs> you stare at the thing, but you just can't figure out what the person is talking about. Color stupidity. Um, so being able to see the five there is something that can be in place long before you are able to report the color. Indeed, it may be long before you are able to access the color for any purpose at all. There's a quote that is always stuck in my head from the great uh, neuropsychologist Luria, who was visiting in Uzbekistan and talked to an Uzbek peasant who said, us Uzbeks don't know the colors of things and so we call everything blue. Um, now, when he said that, he wasn't um, saying we are all colorblind. He was saying, we just can't get it about the colors of things. The color vocabulary of the ancient Greeks is not at all like ours. It, ha it doesn't have pure words for colors. Colors and textures and other aspects of the object are kind of mixed up. Access to color is an achievement. It's not something you get just by being able to see the five there. That's very clear if you think about a Bengal tiger out in the, um, wherever it is that Bengal tigers live, um, the veldt, the savannah. <laughs> um, color is um, um, important to any animal for the identification of objects. That's what color vision is for, identifying objects against their backgrounds. An interest in color for its own sake is something quite different. Attending to the colors of things is something quite different. And you might be able to see the five there and be quite unable to engage in color induction. That's to say, well, all, all the gold ones have been 
edible so far, so probably this one is edible. That kind of color induction is something over and above being able to see the five. Um, being able to sort things, classify things according to their color is a further skill over and above being able to see the five. Now, um, um, this contrast is written large in Huang and Paschler's um, picture of visual attention. So what we have on the left here is a kind of collection of Trismanian feature maps um, where the locations of various features in the environment you're looking at are all specified. So you get a map for movement, a map specifying the locations of all the colors, a map specifying the, the, the locations at which things are at various orientations. And what you can do is, um, on this picture, say, let's have a look at all the red regions and pull out the red. So here you've got, or it might, as it might be in my diagram, the green regions. So here you've pulled out the five. Then there's a, that's the selection step where you single out a region or object to which to attend. And then at the second step, you go back down to those same array of trees, many, and feature maps. And you say, now, what is it like? What is going on? I mean, I don't mean in a nagel sense. I mean, what is the what colors, orientations, and so on do we have at that object? And these are two distinct steps. What I've been emphasizing here is the possibility of being able to select on the basis of color without being able to access color. Now, as I said, virtually everyone who ties consciousness to attention is doing so by saying, um, uh, the content of your visual experience is what you've accessed, and indeed that's what um, uh, Huang and Paschler do. They say what you access, that's what gives you the content of your visual experience. I think from the example of the five, you can see that that can't be right. Um, you can see the five before you can access colors at all. But you wouldn't be able to see the five at all unless you were able to, um, unless the color was actually making a difference to your experience. If you can see the five, you must be having experience of color. I mean, that's the whole point of the test, right? I mean, otherwise, um, <laughs> decades of testing has been a waste of time. Um, uh, but you can see the five, and the color therefore be making a difference to your visual experience, even though you are unable to access the color of the object. I mean, I don't think there is a contradiction in the idea that you could see the five without having experience of the color. It's rather that I think we can make nothing of the idea that that might be happening. I think what it would be, the experience is completely uniform as to color. But if someone says, can you see the five? Well, you can do a kind of blind sight style guessing that I guess there's a five in there, and you might be getting that right. That's very different to having visual experience of the five itself. So what I'm saying is that um, seeing the thing makes, means that seeing the five means that the color is making a difference to your visual experience, yet the color may not be accessible to the subject. So we should tie visual experience, the fact that colors, that shapes, that other people are showing up in your visual experience has to do with the possibility of using those characteristics as a basis for selection. What you then go on to access, what characteristics you then go on to make explicit of the object is a further question. I'm suggesting that we should think of visual experience as providing boundary conditions for the operation of those mechanisms of selection and access. In the ordinary way, it's only visible properties in the conscious visual field that can serve as the basis for selection and action. So then, the next issue is, if we think of it like that, if we think of visual experience as a relation between you and a segment of the world, and that segment of the world is full of properties and characteristics that you can consequently potentially use as a basis for selection of objects or regions and then make explicit various aspects of them. How should we think of the causal relations here? 
what kind of notion of consciousness of, of sorry what kind of notion of causality do we need I mean I guess that is a generic question of this uh, uh, whole session but what notion of causation do we need to be able to uh, talk about the causal role of this relation of visual experience seeing the object well the general notion of causation that's used in, the notion of causation that's used in science generally is some kind of idealized experiment. If you're asking, does quantity A make a difference to quantity B? Um, is quantity A a cause of quantity B? I think most scientists just take it for granted, actually, that the quest, that's the same as the question, what would happen if you did an experiment that changed A, would it make a difference to B? And if you think of a causal system, a system you're trying to characterize as causal functioning, in terms of a bunch of variables, um, suppose you're asking, does waking up early make you wealthier? Um, well, you've got a system here characterizing all the um, uh, uh, various characteristics that might contribute to um, making you wealthier. You have making you wealthy here. And then what we want to do is be able to come from outside and intervene on people's, um, on the time at which people get up and see if that makes a difference to their wealth. If you're asking, does smoking make a difference to cancer? Then ideally, <laughs> in some sense ideally, what you do is take your population feed everyone different levels of nicotine, and then see what happens to the cancer outcome. In any randomized controlled trial, this is exactly what you're doing. You come from outside the system, you have some intervention outside the system, acts in this variable, suspends the effect of all other variables, and then you look at your outcome. So in general, a causal question is a question as to what would happen as the outcome of an idealized experiment. If you did the experiment and you got everything right, then, uh, 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 I mean, in uh, managing your controls and managing your confounds, what would happen then? Um, the thing is, the thing about um, um, conscious experience in the brain is that there seem to be so many levels at which you could characterize your cause variables and your outcome variables. We need to know at what level should we be characterizing the system. Um, so suppose you think of, in terms of a cause variable and an outcome variable here, and you think, I've got a cause variable with lots of different values. Like, it might be lots of different values of conscious experience, or lots of different values of um, aggregate rates of neural firing of cells in some area, and you've got some outcome like verbal judgments about how the world is. What kind of map do you want from this kind of uh, uh, cause variable onto your outcome variable? I mean, ideally, what would you be looking for? Well, I think ideally what you'd be looking for is a function that is, in some intuitive sense, nice. And by nice, what I mean is... Um, uh, for each value of your cause variable here, you want there to be some value or other of your outcome variable. You want the function to be total. You don't want any gratuitous redundancy. You don't want there to be lots of different values of your cause variable that are being mapped to the same value of your outcome variable. You want it to be computable, not just in um, some abstract sense, but in some quite practical sense that you can actually figure out in, in a reasonable time what the uh, uh, out value is of the outcome variable for any value of your cause variable. You ideally want there to be some kind of dose-response relationship between your um, cause variable and your outcome variable. The more cigarettes you smoke, the likelier you are to get cancer. The, the uh, thing doesn't go all over the place. And you want your cause variable to be manipulable by local processes. So just to illustrate, suppose you have here a simple radio. Suppose that you are a Martian who has encountered a, a human radio and you note that sound comes out of the loudspeaker at different times, at different volumes. Being a Martian, you may be able to give a complete characterization 
of the underlying uh, Newtonian physics of all the particles in the radio. So here is a kind of artist's impression of that. And you may note that um, intervening on that total matrix of uh, uh, the underlying physics of your, of your radio does make a difference to the, um, to, the vo to the loudness you get from the speaker. But of course, that kind of map doesn't meet those conditions. It's not total, because for lots of the values here, the radio may have melted, the radio may have evaporated, um, there may be nothing coming out of the loudspeaker, so it's not total. You've certainly got a lot of redundancy, because there will be many changes you could make to the particular uh, particles here that don't make any difference at all to the uh, loudness. Um, it's probably not going to be computable um, uh, if there's anything chaotic about the system at all. It's not going to be dose response because there's going to be nothing here that you could systematically move up and make a have the volume move up smoothly. Um, and uh, uh, this will be, I guess, manipulable by local processes in principle if you have some kind of nanotechnology. But intuitively, you're describing the system here at the wrong level. In contrast, consider as a cause of the... Uh, uh, loudness of the sound coming out of the loudspeaker, the position of the volume knob. What about that as a candidate for the cause of the volume coming out? This is beautiful. Every position in the volume knob is correlated with a particular level of loudness. There's no redundancy. Every position of the volume knob gets matched to a particular level of loudness. It's computable, it's easy, the more you, t uh, it's dose response, the more you turn it, the more the volume goes up. And it's certainly manipulable by local process. Processes, I mean, that is the great thing about a knob. You, <laughs> you can take it in your fingers and turn it. Um, so what we want when we're looking for um, a cause variable is something that is systemically, in that way, related to outcome. Um, I mean, let me give just one other example of this. Suppose that there's a prize announced for progress into the causes of cancer, and you have a scanner that lets you make very fine-grained uh, scans of people's bodies, of the detailed configuration of people's bodies. Uh, now, over the years, if you do some massive longitudinal study, you might have a catalogue of total microphysical states that are predictive of getting cancer or not getting cancer. But you then say, I've now discovered the causes of cancer. But of course you've made no progress at all. What we want to know when we're asking about the causes of cancer are things like, uh, does smoking do it? Does exposure to lead do it? You want things that have that kind of dose response systemic relation to cancer as an outcome. And this kind of procedure isn't getting you anywhere. So what I would suggest about consciousness as a cause is that often if you look at detailed uh, cell assemblies, you are not going to get that kind of uh, nice map onto the psychological outcomes you are interested in. When we're looking for the causes of psychological outcomes, if you're looking for the causes of um, psychiatric disorders, if you're looking for the causes of um, our forming correct beliefs about the world, if you're looking for the causes of our having knowledge about the world, moving to a level of description of the cell assemblies is not going to give you that kind of nice map between cause variable and outcome variable. What we want for cause is for causation is for X and Y to be correlated under interventions on X in the case where X is what I call a control variable for Y in something like the sense in which um, uh, the volume control is a control variable for loudness. Now, I think that the kind of relational picture of experience that I've been suggesting has a special place when it comes to explaining how it is that we have not just probable opinion but um, knowledge of the world around us. It's sometimes said that in order to have knowledge of the world around you, 
your evidence for what you're saying must have, must confer on your conclusion, a probability of one. Any um, uh, finite, any probability that's lower than one is not going to be knowledge. And that's shown, I guess, by the lottery paradox that um, if you have a lottery ticket, then uh, it doesn't matter how many other tickets there are in the lottery. Um, you don't know that you're not going to win. If there are 10 other tickets in the lottery, then there's only a one, a one in what 11 chance that you'll uh, win. But you still don't know that you're not going to win. That remains so if there's 100 tickets in the lottery, if there are a million tickets in the lottery, you still don't know that you are not going to win. The evidence that you have must give what you claim to know a probability of one in order for it to be knowledge. And there's a special place for experience in conferring that kind of um, uh, certainty on your claim. Um, Austin had this example back in the 1950s. Austin said, suppose I'm wondering whether there's a pig in the woods. I'm told it's unlikely, but then I come upon more and more evidence that there's a pig there. I have evidence that makes it more and more likely. I see the droppings. I see whatever all the characteristic signs are of there being a pig in the woods. I have all this evidence that makes it more and more probable that there's a pig there. None of that counts as any, for anything, really, uh, beside the actual confrontation, the experiential encounter with the pig itself. Now I know, you would say, now I know there's a pig there all right. Our ordinary experience, as we look around us, um, um, gives, uh, uh, gives us a kind of knowledge of the world that we couldn't have without conscious experience. Um, someone who had only a blindsight style guessing as to what was in the world around them, no matter uh, how good they got, no matter how many thousands or tens of thousands of trials they were subjected to, no matter how good they knew themselves to be at this, wouldn't have knowledge of the world and they would only have more and more probable opinion. Your experience of your hand of the other people gives you knowledge in a way nothing else can. So what I'm saying about this relation of conscious experience to the things around you is that in characterizing the way in which experience gives you knowledge, you should think of experience as constituted in its content by the external scene itself. Um, of course there is an underlying mechanism and various properties in the scene, can, you can be playing this causal role of lifting out particular objects or regions to, or, so that you can then access, make explicit further characteristics of them. It's this relational characteristic of ordinary experience that explains how it can generate knowledge. Okay, that's the end of the message. <laughs>